Okay, great. Welcome to the second session. So now we turn to national ministers to get a more uh, member state focused take on these issues. We have very many speakers for you, uh, so many speakers that there are more speakers than chairs. So instead of introducing everyone to you at the beginning, I will introduce them to you one by one as they speak, and then we'll have um, two additional people join us. At the podium, Minister Lidegaard is running late. He's coming in on a flight. I think he's landed, he's on his way. He's or he's here? Yes, great. <laughs> so in fact, are you ready to speak now, or do you yeah, want yeah, to yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so we will open with uh, Minister Lidegaard, the Minister for Climate, Energy, and Building from Denmark. Okay, there? Is that yours? Uh, you can take seated if you want. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, good to see you, and thank you a lot to the Lithuanian Presidency for hosting this event. I think it's my third or even fourth time in Vilnius within the last few months, and as always, you are the perfect host, Jaroslav, and uh, it's impressive that you got the energy and the commitment to continue. I think I know Vilnius better than my own Copenhagen by the time. And I can tell you that the Danish delegation, delegation has got a kind of core competence in exploring now the beer houses of Vilnius. So I'm happy to be here. Now, one year ago, uh, I was so lucky and honored to host the first meeting in what we call the Northern European Energy Dialogue, which was an attempt to gather all the countries around the Baltic Sea in an attempt to speed up the investments in infrastructure, in interconnectors, uh, in order to mobilize the political will for a political vision of a complete internal energy market of Northern Europe and, of course, ultimately, of the whole of Europe. And the reason why we wanted to do that among the Northern European countries, of course, was threefold. And you probably know all the good reasons for uh, increasing the investments in infrastructure and creating competitive markets. The first reason, of course, is that if you get an internal energy market, you also get competition and you get lower prices. And lower prices, that's exactly what we need in order to be able to compete with our neighboring regions and other parts of the world. The second reason being that we need to stabilize and increase our security of supply. And thirdly, but not least, we need the interconnectors and the market to ensure that we can actually include more low carbon technologies, especially renewables. And it's our, I would say, experience among the Nordic countries that if you do that in an intelligent way, you actually get all free benefits out of the market and that the renewable will not have to be supported so heavily because if you can sell your renewables at the market, you don't need to subsidize them so much. So there's both an economic benefit and there is a more technological benefit because it becomes easier to integrate renewables at the market. So there are many really good reasons for actually improving our investments. Now, the 10th of October this year, my good friend and colleague, UK Secretary of State for Climate and Energy, Mr. Edward Davy from UK, then hosted the second meeting in the NEED group, in the Northern European Energy Dialogue group. And he should have been here today, but I have promised him to just give a brief introduction to what we discussed at this meeting in October. Some of you participated, some could not. And I actually think we took some very important lessons out of that because the core question, of course, is what does it take to increase more investments? What does it take to attract private and public investors to actually make the interconnectors, to make the investments which are required? And I think that if I should put it very briefly, and that's exactly what I should, then it will put demands on both Europe and each and every national state in Europe. At the European level, we have a process going on, as you know, um, within the 10E regulations. We have made the imminent union-wide list of projects of common 
interest, and now we have to push and give priority to which of these projects we should actually support through the EU. But equally as important is that we get a clear political framework for the European market towards 2030. And the discussions we had in London make it very clear that we need definitely target for CO2 so we know where we are hitting at. We had discussions about how many targets, but one thing we actually agreed upon was that maybe it would be an idea to consider also a target for infrastructure. For many, many countries in Europe, it makes no sense to increase the amount of renewables if we don't at the same time increase the amount of infrastructure. We have already a target at the Barcelona Agreement. We have discussed whether it would be possible to increase that. And I actually think that today, but this is just on behalf of Denmark and not the whole NEED group, I would just like to say that I really think we should consider such a target because I think it would be more easy and more profitable to all countries and to you as such if we do that while we at the same time are heading for new investments in, in renewables. So that's what we need to do at the European level. But makes no mistake, we also have to work with this at the national state uh, level. I will not risk to become a little technical, but I actually think it's probably my most important point today. I want to take you through a very small story of the Nordic countries. It's only 15 years ago that we decided among Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark to create a Nordic power market. And we asked our TSOs, would you be so kind to make social economic benefits of how good an idea it is to actually make these interconnectors? And they came out telling us that it was not that good an idea, because if you actually calculate in each and every country, it's much better business just to keep for yourself and don't make cross-border connections, because then you don't have the competition. Then it took a political decision to ask them, could you try to make regional social economic benefit calculation to find out how much value you actually create if you all of you open your markets build the interconnectors and create a real energy single market. And so they did, and of course they found out that it was probably the best decision we ever took among the Nordic energy ministers to open up the borders and create one single energy market among the Nordic countries. And fortunately, you are going to join that, many of you, but of course the vision should be that we could create that for whole Europe. But that takes that each and every of us at home kindly ask our TSOs to get this regional approach right, and then we allow them, if there is a good business case, to actually make the investments in the new interconnectors and pay them over the tariffs, because you don't get the investments if you don't have the regulation right. And to me, that's probably the biggest barrier we are facing today in Europe, is that to many TSO, it's not really, it doesn't really make sense, because they're not allowed to take the regional economic approach. So there's a lot of homework to do to all of us to ensure that we push. And of course, there should be a business case. Of course, it should be a social economic benefit, but at a regional scale. And if it's that, we should allow our TSOs to actually invest. That was, I think, the most important lessons we took from the need meeting in London. And I'm uh, looking very much forward to, to continue the discussion here today. And of course, to take it on, because as we all know, the next six months will be crucial and very important when it comes to decisions about energy politics in Europe. And I think that if we miss this chance before the Commission will be changed and the whole Parliament will be changed, it will take a long time before we get the chance again. And that would be my final note. Over the next 20 years, we will have to renew or reinvest in 80% of the present power production capacity in Europe. It's a defining moment, it's a historical chance to get rid of our deep dependency of importing fossil fuels and get a right investing in local resources, in local grids, and create a real European vision for an internal single clean energy market. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, particularly for that update from London. I should mention just recently, uh, Minister Ledegaard and Minister Davy were in Brussels for the Green Growth uh, group of 13 ministers who are uh, focusing on these issues right now. Uh, let's move on to Yuhen Parts. He is the Minister for Economic Affairs and Communications for Estonia. Thank you very much, and of course I join with my Danish colleague, and I want to gratitude our Lithuanian colleague for excellent uh, presidency and also very, I, f I will say, very intensive energy program for this half year. There are many, many interesting uh, discussions, council, but I've also, I also think that today's meeting, which I understand we, we are celebrating, their, uh, the decision that the PCI list as a very important European tool is now there, uh, is, uh, is I've not hesitate to say is historical. I would like to just, as time is very limited, to make two comments, I will not say, uh, about uh, some thoughts from the Estonian side. Before that, I just want to underline that uh, generally their Estonian perspective, their uh, the goal uh, to develop the well-functioning energy internal market, both of electricity and gas, have uh, very challenging, and I think we if we look back uh, what we have, where we stand uh, five years ago and where we stand now, I think we have uh, moved uh, significantly uh, uh, forward, significantly forward, especially from this Baltic Islands perspective. Despite that, that we are now talking about the new investments and we are talking about a lot of new market arrangements, we also have to realize that we have had a great success. Uh, it's very uh, uh, important to inform this audience that at the moment there is already going uh, a testing uh, of phase of uh, Estonian Finnish, the second interconnections, testing 2 and we really hope that uh, everything is going smoothly and uh, their very important piece of uh, overall goal to join the Nordic and Baltic markets will be on the hands of the market already on the February of the next year. So it's very soon, after some months. That will mean that we already have 1,000 megawatt uh, interconnections, which was not, uh, which was really, uh, seems uh, impossible challenge uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago. And of course it will have uh, more significance uh, uh, influence if also the Lithuanian-Swedish connection will be there and of course we are going to follow Lithuanian-Polish uh, collaboration. So I think the real things happening especially in the electricity market. The other story is related to the gas issue uh, but I'm not going to be detailed here. I hope that we have opportunity to have a discussion. What I really want to uh, have a, two general uh, remarks before we are now going to this process of assessing uh, PCI projects, uh, our regulators have a lot of to do to the next six months and we have to have agreements, all region of uh, overall Europe and also in our region. So first, I think that uh, uh, the consumer's perspective, we are very often underestimating the, the impact of the real consumers. Of course, we all and also commissioner uh, say that we are preparing the so-called energy price uh, Council, this is coming uh, a, a critical issue for economical recovery as a whole, uh, a, a longer perspective, but, but I also want to underline that if we are going to discuss these necessary investments for energy infrastructure, we really should uh, uh, take the standing point that no any infrastructure, energy infrastructure will not automatically mean that there will be a benefit for the consumer. So therefore, in, in Estonian case, I don't know uh, how specific we are that uh, all these infrastructure investments should be covered to the price. In Estonian case, the, the share of the transmission costs are relatively high. It's uh, on the end prices, uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, around the 40% and every investment, which sound like a nice ideal, will can be really uh, uh, not bring the benefits even from the medium term, maybe also for the longer term. So therefore, I think uh, we, what we really want to underline that uh, the co consumer uh, uh, 
protection or, or not every infrastructure will not mean that uh, we will uh, get uh, positive uh, impacts for the consumers will be meet. So this is very important and it seems sometimes me that these souls, uh, all our industries uh, are much highest lobbying than the consumers who are in the end of the day we are, not only our households but also the industries. My second uh, statement is that luckily the, the PCI process addresses the issue of uh, socio-economic costs and benefits. To my mind, we have reached the most important phase of this process because right now the national regulators and uh, ACER are making decisions about the cost allocation of the projects. The challenging part is that the PCIs have a cross-border nature by definition and the costs and benefits reach beyond borders of just one state. It will be very interesting to follow how all around the EU, almost 250 and more solidarity tests are conducted. To me, the cross-border cost allocation decisions seem to be a very good indicator on how much complete the energy, internal energy market actually is. I will be optimistic because in Estonia we have a positive experience with two Estlink electricity interconnectors. The, the key success factors have been mutual interest of the states and flexibility in ownership structures and financing models, including the support from the EU. If energy infrastructure is the skeleton, the gross border cost allocation together with the connecting European facility is the blood supply for the internal energy market. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will stay in the Baltic for Daniels Pavlutz, who is Minister of Economics for Latvia. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague minister, the members of the parliament, uh, I'm really honored to be here and, and talk from the podium, although we would have prepared to stay, but you know, since this is the fashion, let's do it this way. But I'll be short as much as I can because there is the privilege of speaking uh, later is that many of the most important points have already been made and this is the case as well today. Now, before I do, uh, also, Yaroslav, very, very many thanks for organizing many events on energy. I mean, when I realized that my iPad and my alpha iPhone automatically, you know, connect to the network because they remember the passwords, <laughs> right? I realized I've been coming to Venus many times over the last months and weeks. Not too many, many, it's a good thing. All right, we are celebrating the beginning of uh, actually implementation work of the PCI list projects. And I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with uh, Johan Parts uh, from Estonia that really this marks the most important part of this. Although we've spent a lot of time, a long time, uh, coming to this point, the most important point is actually now. And uh, something I would like to thank the previous panel for is for putting today's discussion in the context, particularly the uh, chief economist of the International Energy Agency for putting things in perspective. I think something that paradoxically comes out of, of that presentation is that although we are very familiar with the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty in the energy markets in the coming years and decades, in many ways, the things that await us in say 10 or 15 years time in, to some degree are clearer than what, ex what awaits us in the next three to five years. We know that eventually we are going to have a liquid LNG market. We expect to have a well-functioning natural gas market in the world in general. Uh, we expect to have that the price setting mechanisms will have changed. The big questions are when and to what. Now in that sense, with the infrastructure projects we are now implementing, with the cost structures being approved, with cost allocation decisions to be made, it is very difficult to see what exactly will be the way this will work out for the projects, project promoters, project financiers, and of course consumers. And yet, yet another point I have to agree with the Estonian minister that we have to keep consumer in the equation. 
because the benefits from uh, in implementing these infrastructure projects will have to be substantial from access to other markets such as LNG in order to justify the investment cost and in order for that not to translate into major cost increases for the end consumers through the regulated parts of the tariffs. Something about the implementation. It is clear now that there are decisions that need to be made in our region as well. Decisions about which projects to implement. Clearly we have to have a complex approach. We need both the pipeline connection to mainland Europe, the gas interconnection between Poland and Lithuania in order to be able to have arbitrage opportunity to have, uh, let's say, virtual trades, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be part of the European system. At the same time, we have to open up the Baltics and the Eastern Baltics in general for LNG market because that exposes our gas market to the global trends, to the global developments in the gas, uh, gas market in general. But I have a slight worry that if we do not make the decisions we expected to make, they will be made, but they will be made by the technical process. And I think we should not allow the technical process that PCI project management envisages make those decisions for us. I think the decisions that need to be made, such as regarding the location of the regional NG in, in the Baltics, needs to be made now. It's long overdue and it is actually a crucial part for our market opening strategies on legal, political, and many other dimensions. So I think that I'll conclude by saying that clearly we are now at the beginning of the practical implementation phase. They say talk is cheap, not always. In this case, the talk has taken a long time, has probably cost us a lot in, in opportunity cost, in, in resources, in savings. So now is time to walk the talk and this time is now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will move to the other end of Europe. Uh, we will hear from uh, Dragomir Stoinev, who is the Minister of Economy and Energy for Bulgaria. Thank you, dear Minister Neverovich, dear members of Parliament, <clears throat> Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm for the second time here in Vilnius. It's I'm really, really pleased uh, to be here in this beautiful city. It's very, very important for me to participate in the discussion of such an important issue as the measures needed for the uh, completion in the European energy market. We are all convinced that the well-functioning market is essential to achieving the goals of providing a safe, consumer-oriented, secure, and competitive energy supply. Efforts in this respect should be intensified, especially in a view of improving the coordination and the cooperation among member states. The EU energy policy and related efforts should primarily benefit of the EU business and citizens, as well as the vulnerable consumers. In view of the main objective of a competitive internal energy market to ensure affordable prices and special emphasis should be put upon establishing a new type of relationship between suppliers and consumers, where consumers will have the possibility to monitor their bills and costs, manage their consumption, and choose suppliers. We do believe that the availability of adequate energy infrastructure, including straightened and upgraded national energy networks, more efficient energy transmission and distribution, as well as diversified energy suppliers, play an important role in removing the existing obstacles and barriers, together with providing physical possibility for the efficient integration of the regional markets into one single EU energy market. In this context, additional financial mechanisms are needed to ensure the construction of the relevant energy infrastructure. The timely implementation of the regulation on trans-European energy infrastructure is an important 
prerequisite for improving the security and diversification of energy supplies in the EU, eliminating the energy islands and ensuring the physical operation of the internal energy market. The improvement of gas and electricity interconnections is a special issue for Bulgaria because of the relative isolation of the country, the scarcity of local resources and dependence on a single supplier of natural gas. Therefore, our efforts are now focused on the construction of gas interconnections with all our uh, neighbors country. Next year we will start to build our interconnection with Greece. With Romania the interconnection will be ready next year. With Serbia we are ready, we are starting, but I think that our neighbor they have some difficulties to uh, follow our rhythm. Special priority in the medium term should be given to the, uh, to the large investment needs of a number of member states in a view of increasing share of renewable energy sources. The application of support schemes, uh, schemes inevitably results in an increased share of energy from renewable sources in energy mix. At the same time, the large-scale penetration of renewable sources may lead to shifting investments from the co conventional energy sector and have negative impacts on both the electricity system and employment in these sectors. The costs of the financial support might result in higher energy prices that could affect affordability and the competitiveness of energy intensive industries. The sustainable operation of the internal energy market can be ensured through a relation, uh, through a, a rational utilization of the available local energy resources by using state-of-the-art, highly effective and low emission solutions. The increase of renewable energy sources shares, the efficient utilization of local coal and the development of, of new natural gas deposits in compliance with the environmental requirements and the development of nuclear energy technologies in compliance with the nuclear safety standards. In conclusion, we welcome the adoption of the first union of list of projects of common interest and do believe this will become the basis for the development of the relevant infrastructure and uh, uh, completion of the internal energy market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Stilio Simonas. He is the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Energy, Commerce, Industry and Tourism for Cyprus. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate the Lithuanian Presidency and especially Minister Nevarovic for inviting us and for organizing uh, this uh, timely event. Uh, honorable ministers, members of the parliament, ladies and gentlemen, the EU's main energy policy goal is the completion of the internal energy market and the strengthening of the energy supply and competitiveness of the union. Completing the internal market by 2014 and ending the energy isolation of all member states from the electricity and gas networks are our most urgent short-term objectives. And while very close to this deadline, there is still a lot to be done to accomplish these objectives. Accomplishing them requires that we address not only the challenges at European level, but also at national level where the special characteristics of some member states, like Cyprus, stress the need to design and apply well-targeted and tailor-made measures. A prerequisite for the completion of the internal energy market is the development of the necessary energy infrastructure. The regulation concerning the, gu the guidelines for trans-European energy infrastructures and the Connecting Europe Facility Regulation pave the way and provide the means 
to stimulate private investments. Cyprus has achieved a very high growth in the res electricity sector over the last three years. The penetration of electricity from renewable sources increased from 0% in 2009 to 5.5% in 2012. This was achieved as a result mainly of support schemes since 2004. However, it is a fact that the household as well as the business consumers have to pay probably the highest electricity prices uh, in Europe. And clearly, this impacts significantly the competitiveness of our economy. Our efforts to provide affordable and reliable energy are constrained due to the lack of interconnections and, st and storage capacity. These barriers impose serious technical limitations in relation to the amount of energy that can flow in the network from inter intermittent renewable energy sources. Tackling the challenges of the increasingly variable renewable energy generation while maintaining high standards of security of supply and ensuring competitiveness is one of the biggest challenges in an isolated electricity system. It is without doubt that it would be cheaper to face these challenges at the European level through integrated markets and in the longer term through high voltage, long distance and new electricity storage technologies. That is why we, strongly pro we are strongly promoting the realization of the EuroAsia Interconnector, a project of common interest that aims at connecting the Cypriot, Israeli and Greek transmission networks and allow for reverse transmission of 2,000 megawatts of electricity. The diversification of Europe's energy supply, including the increase of EU energy generation and development of indigenous resources is of utmost importance for the completion of the EU internal energy market. The exploitation of indigenous resources will ensure our security of supply in a sustainable manner and at competitive and affordable prices. The recent discoveries of gas reserves in the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus and in the wider area of the, of the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as the high prospects for more discoveries can potentially change the geopolitics and economics of the region and turn the Mediterranean into a reliable energy supplier for Europe, offering an alternative route for the supply of, nat of natural gas. The Mediterranean gas storage and the complementary pipeline project from offshore Cyprus to Greece are two PCIs for the transportation of gas from the offshore fields in the area. The Mediterranean gas storage facility is associated with the LNG terminal that we have decided to establish in Cyprus. It will store liquefied gas from the Levantine basis, which can be further exported to the, to the European and international markets. The LNG terminal can be a regional energy infrastructure that will contribute to the diversification of Europe's supply sources and the enhancement of its energy security. It can be a hub for cooperation between the countries of the Eastern Med and serve as a direct link of the Eastern Med with the EU. The transportation of gas for liquefaction to the LNG plant in Cyprus would allow neighboring countries to securely export their gas to the, to the European Union and Asian markets. Cooperation of this nature can serve as a vehicle for regional dialogue. Energy should not be a source of conflict but rather a tool for conflict resolution, a tool to create a peaceful and stable environment which could eventually contribute to the peace and stability in the Eastern Mediterranean and to, benefit, and to the benefit of EU at large. In concluding, I would like to stress that adequate, integrated and reliable energy networks are a crucial prerequisite for achieving our energy goals and boost our economy. Especially in these difficult economic times, the need is more profound to focus our work to deliver a complete and properly functioning internal market in which all member states 
participate equally. It is only then that we will be able to bridge the national borders and enable all European consumers to actively participate and equally benefit from the single energy market. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, next we're going to, thank you very much. Uh, next we're going to move to two of the EU's neighbors. Our first speaker will be speaking in Romanian, so you have uh, headsets at your seats if you need translation into English. Uh, so our next speaker is Valeriu Lazar, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for the Economy from Moldova. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I will speak in uh, Romanian. First of all, I would like to thank you very much to my colleague, Minister Neverovich, for my invitation, for this invitation to Vilnius. I am for the first time in Vilnius. I would like to say that Mr. Minister and uh, Mr. Colleagues, the your capital, Vilnius, is very often uh, said in Moldova in context, uh, you know, uh, the, f in the end of this month, at, at 29th of November, uh, Republic, of, Republic of Moldova will, will initialize two documents, very important documents, association agreement and respectively uh, uh, DCFTA agreement. So Vilnius for us is one of the reference city in this year. I came to Vilnius yesterday immediately after a meeting uh, in the central uh, square of the city, uh, about 100,000 uh, 100, uh, people which have um, said that they, uh, they are in favor of uh, European integration. And I would like to bring this energy from Kishinev to Vilnius energy of the people, and it's very useful to participate inclusive on this platform of discussions of, on energy and principal advantage that is that uh, we are on the same uh, platform with our colleagues from um, uh, European countries which have already expertise and uh, lessons uh, uh, on the way of integration in, into EU, including in the uh, sector of energy sector. So, as uh, is already said, uh, well said, it's a very complicated uh, sector with the implication of politics, economics, and so on. But for the Republic of Moldova, it's, uh, it's also an implication of geopolitical order. We, it's, it is very useful to be united, be connected to the uh, energy grid, uh, energy, um, and not to, to have the same mistakes which, which already uh, some colleagues from other countries which have had. Moldova is a specific case. There are some uh, similar uh, similarities with our colleagues from uh, Baltic states. And specific for Moldova is if we are on the same form of uh, physically, uh, from point of view of um, uh, physical interconnections, we, we are connected uh, through Ukraine to the ex-Soviet market, to the former Soviet market together with Russia and Belarus. Uh, a part of the energy uh, and 100% uh, of gas, gas uh, we, are, have, uh, we import, import from uh, Russia and from a uh, point of view of technical um, uh, point of view, we are dependent from one source, only one uh, sources, only one. So uh, beginning with 2010, we are part of a uh, contract of the EU concerning the energy. And this is very interesting situation because uh, playing rules, we uh, implement playing rules, uh, Europeans playing the rules, it's institutions and practices conforming in conformity with European uh, practices uh, and a key, uh, European a key, but we physically are um, connected to the ex-Soviet uh, system, and it's the very, uh, is a great uh, 
challenge for us to be here and to, con to continue discussions on this uh, issue. So, and Busik and uh, the, uh, Mr. Busik and uh, in Belgrade will, will uh, continue these uh, discussions and the process of integration uh, um, in, in the European market. We are in the most important uh, moment. We have to pass from uh, uh, rules to the concrete, concrete measures. The citizens are waiting for us um, how we uh, will pass from uh, the word reforms to practical uh, issues. The people would like to, to see a functional uh, market because if we all discuss very much about this uh, liberalization of the market and we'll through the politics, European uh, politics to, of migration, step by step to the um, uh, competition market. We have to be very, very attentive, very careful to see what we, uh, how we'll do it uh, and to assure the country with the necessary sources of energy. Because uh, if we will not do this in practice, we, have, we will have no effect uh, which we would like to have. We have a strategy of energy. It was adopted by the government up to 2030. We are in line with the objectives uh, of European objectives. Uh, in the field, including in diversifying the sources of uh, energy and using of uh, uh, re renewable energy. And the main challenge, as I said, it was, we have to have these uh, interconnections through systems from Romania and to be connected to the European uh, European uh, uh, interconnections and to have the uh, indeed an, a real um, uh, market, uh, competition market. Republic of Moldova is in the list of uh, common project of European projects. There are two projects uh, to be interconnected on the on in the field of uh, electric electric energy and the support of European partners and the Rom Romanians. Uh, Partner, Romanian partners, we have already a pipeline of gas. It's the first one. In order to be connected uh, and to be, to be part of uh, the European um, uh, interconnections. We actually we have the same problems which I have already had uh, and, uh, and by my colleagues, uh, which has uh, uh, said about the interconnections, the, the same, the same problems. But I would like to to, to say that on the common market, where the, there are common rules, uh, also the prices will be common, um, because uh, in other way it will be not common market. The specific is that, that in Moldova, advantages to be connected to the European uh, network, it's, and the, it's a long time, it's a lasting process. Uh, but um, there are provocation for the middle uh, medium also, because reforms we have already implemented beginning with 2009, uh, there means uh, double and triple uh, even uh, uh, of tariffs for gas, for, for energy, electric, uh, or for electricity, and the double uh, prices tariffs for gas. So the economy uh, grows not with the same uh, speed. And uh, for population, we, we have to, to find an, an, uh, an balance to finance uh, project of interconnections and to be very careful with uh, the real capacity of economy and the possibilities of population to be in a balance. Uh, it's a problem for, for Moldova. We need very much the solidarity of Europe, uh, values of European values also. We need this. And uh, we could not allow to, to, to face with uh, these uh, challenges which are common for Moldova also as for the other countries. Uh, 
I think that Moldova could come with uh, its possibility to reform a strategy uh, or energy, energy strategy and uh, to see how to, to could be implemented in the region, uh, this strategy. The countries are different, but we are, have uh, common values, and but the speed uh, to, to this value is different for Moldova also because there are implications of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, geopolitical implications. It's not so simple. Uh, and some few, uh, if not to be pessimistic, I, I, I would like to say some positive uh, issues. We would like to utilize, to, to use the energy efficiently. But we we come to some tariffs which are very high and all consumers and all and producers also they um, they we have this year of, of five percent of growing of economy but consumption of energy is minus three percent so indeed the adequate uh, tariff of politic uh, policy will uh, have as a result energy efficiency. And so we have achieved an, an objective, political objective to, to, to make so the bills will be uh, lower. I think we have convinced the uh, consumers from Moldova and uh, politicians that political objectives is not to, to, to is, its objective is to reduce the bills for consumers. It's very important. Well, we are already in the stage when we see already practical results. Yes, which are sustained by the uh, programs of the government of energy efficiency with support of the EU, and we are very grateful to this. As a rule, energy efficiency is associated more is uh, on the side of consumers. We have to say clearly that we will have results if the energy energetic efficiency will be a, a word which will uh, be the main in, the, in this uh, in this issue. Also, supplier and producer and consumers. All, all should be uh, on. Uh, all should, should think about this energy efficiency. In the last four years, we have. Uh, we have good results. And and distributor of energy have uh, paid a lot of uh, dividends abroad. What I would like to say, we have to, to elaborate regulations and to see why is the, could be the balance for the world. And the world should understand that consumers should pay tariffs for their security, and the companies should also uh, take into account the the tariffs of, for energy, and not only to, to think that uh, consumers will pay for, for, for high uh, energy. It's very important for us the position of Ukraine, because of the position of Ukraine, uh, it depends our, our, posi our position. The European Commission uh, offers us uh, a grant and we have two options, Ukraine, which is costly, of course, and, and without Ukraine, and, uh, and this, without Ukraine we will have other, other op options, other strategy, and that is why for us it's, it's very important what U Ukraine will do in this context. And finally, there don't exist uh, answer, uh, rhetoric answer. There are uh, questions, there are answers. We have decided to, to go to the to, for in this way, uh, we have challenges and we have to, to undertake uh, dialogues and to, to convince uh, our partners from uh, Moscow, from Russia, that partnership is uh, 
much more better if there, there, there is also competition. We have, uh, we need the support of uh, European partners. So I would like to say once again, thank you to Lithuania. So what is happening in Moldova uh, now is uh, what was happened in, in Lithuania and other Baltic, uh, Baltic states, the same situation in the past, and we are teaching very, very fast uh, from lessons of our colleagues from Baltic states, and uh, we need solidarity and support uh, from our uh, European partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from Fadil Ismaili, who is Minister for Economic Development for Kosovo. He will be speaking in English. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to congratulate and thank you, the Lithuanian government, for uh, uh, chairing the presidency of EU for, for this year and uh, as well for uh, uh, hosting us on this uh, very important uh, uh, issue as the energy is for not just Europe but as well for, for the world. I would like to uh, also uh, thank you uh, Mr. Oettinger uh, and uh, other uh, Mr. Uh, Jerzy Buzek for uh, excellent and comprehensive uh, presentation of the of the issues of energy and the uh, internal energy market for uh, the entire Europe, as well my colleague, Minister of Energy of Lithuanian, Lithuania. But uh, the uh, the presentation of uh, uh, which has been made from uh, Mr. Fatih and. Uh, uh, actually changed my mind and it happens to me very uh, often not to read but uh, to, to, to change the, a little bit the approach and the subject what I, I would like to say in this, in this uh, very moment about the internal energy market. Uh, uh, Republic of Kosovo is a very small youngest country in the world as you may know with around 10,000 uh, square kilometers uh, with um, small population, around 2 million uh, people, uh, and a uh, very young population. Actually, 70% of the population of Kosovo is under the age of 35 years, and 50% uh, of them under the age of, uh, of 25. But uh, hopefully, uh, we have a young, but uh, pretty well-educated uh, population. But due to the historical circumstances, unfortunately, uh, in the most of uh, 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 the, the uh, list, uh, when you look for uh, the economical parameters, uh, we are uh, in the very, very bottom, uh, uh, which, of course, uh, also in the field of energy, uh, brings us uh, to a not a very desirable uh, situation. Uh, on the other hand, being so small country uh, and with all the reforms in the energy uh, field, energy market uh, in, in Europe, uh, we again are in a pretty difficult situation. Why? Kosovo has a comparative advantage uh, for the energy, uh, having in mind that we do have uh, verified uh, coal reserves around 14 billion tons. So we are listed among the most richest uh, country in Europe and in the world uh, with the reserves of lignite, uh, which is um, the best to, uh, for, for uh, coal-fired power plants, of course. Uh, the, the coal which is um, varying from 1,800 to 2,200 kilocalorie. Uh, uh, the oppor good opportunity is it's a less sulfur percentage in our coal than in some others. And uh, we are among the first, on the other hand, really first, if we consider the exploitation condition of this coal, because the ratio be between coal and overburden is one by one. And again, in lack of electricity in Europe, 
with a very high price, as, as we saw from the previous presentation, and uh, the question which uh, normally arises in this moment, and somebody already asked it, uh, which is not matching with an economic logic, why then is no investment in, in, in Europe, or no real investment when the prices are so high, uh, it seems that still remain uh, with a no uh, real, uh, uh, a very pragmatic uh, answer on this. Why I'm giving so much uh, 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 speech on this is that uh, um, I think that it's not only Kosovo, who is the most undevelopment part of maybe uh, Europe and uh, as well Southeast Europe, but also some of our neighboring countries in Southeast Europe, I will not uh, mention now. Uh, I'm not pretty sure that uh, we are really ready to cope with uh, internal energy market. We are, I'm not sure that all of us are really uh, ready uh, to, for 2015, when it is less than two years now uh, from the date which, which was mentioned there. Why? And I now would uh, like a little bit to, to um, flatter uh, what we've done in these circumstances. Kosovo is pretty advanced on the legal and regulatory framework, considering the compatibility with uh, European uh, rules and uh, uh, regulatives and directives in place. Uh, it was uh, maybe a good opportunity. We wanted to hurry. We were ready. Everything would, was coming from Europe to accept. We were thirsty uh, about being part of Europe. But uh, actually, uh, uh, is it enough having in place all compatible laws and rules and procedures? Uh, I can say it is not enough. It is like uh, we have a, a local uh, football team in, in Kosovo and uh, somebody is offering us to play in, play in Premier League, which is unfortunately with the same rules. Uh, and we know the rules, but uh, uh, there is no condition, uh, not 90 minutes, but even less than 45. So uh, uh, why I'm saying this, because, uh, and forgive me, was it Mr. Rottinger or, or Busek who mentioned that we have to think maybe about some reforms of, on, on energy community. On this sense, so, uh, uh, we have some, uh, if nothing else, some derogation on some of the main issues, particularly having in mind not just that we are late on developing the capacities, uh, but uh, as well uh, because uh, the social problems uh, uh, are also very much linked with this. So uh, market, internal market, opening it uh, and, and having all, all these rules in place is not enough because simply a good part of population cannot afford these prices, which as we saw are the, uh, in Europe are the highest in the, in the world, plus the, the, the uh, community with uh, very uh, low uh, income will uh, really uh, face uh, pretty uh, heavy uh, difficulties on this sense. Uh, if I will say that with uh, uh, almost subsidized or a partly subsidized tariffs in Kosovo, and the partly of uh, low tariffs because of the old generators on which we are not counting rate, any, any kind of rate of return since the, their age is almost uh, uh, past the, the uh, lifetime of, of a power plant. And again, the uh, average electricity invoice for the households is almost 30% uh, uh, of the average uh, salary in Kosovo. And I'm pretty sure that uh, there are similar countries, I have representatives of some, some countries here, that will face 
uh, a similar issue. Uh, all this I would not like to sound as a critics uh, uh, that nothing has been done. It has been done a lot from the European Commission, from the uh, DG Energy, uh, through Energy Community Secretariat in Vienna. It's a long process from Athens Forum till uh, signing of the, of the treaty for uh, Energy Community Treaty for Southeast uh, Europe. Uh, all this has been considered uh, many times, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, pretty sure that uh, we can cope with this without a kind of intervention or at least without a small uh, a, a reform to consider this situation of these countries. Uh, Kosovo is a very unflexible system. Uh, the Kosovo load is around 6,000 gigawatt with uh, 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 installed capacity uh, of uh, coal fire, pl fire plants uh, 1,500, of which uh, in, uh, in, in operation are uh, between 800 and 1,000 uh, megawatts. The uh, peak load uh, is um, the big difference between summer and, uh, and uh, uh, winter, uh, which is from uh, 600 to almost 1,200 which tells that uh, the, the people are using the electricity for heating, which is not, of course, good. There are plans, but which will take uh, time. We are now uh, working on the uh, cogeneration uh, for the uh, main, uh, for the capital of Kosovo, which will uh, affect uh, uh, this, uh, reduce this, this difference. But all, all this required a, 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 lot, a, a lot of time. We are uh, um, having in plan, and uh, this uh, situation with the investment on the energy sector, we started with 2,000 megawatt projects, and now uh, we are in 600 megawatts since 2006-07. Uh, uh, the investors uh, has not uh, really expressed the strong uh, willingness to come even with such a uh, perfect uh, condition to uh, explode and uh, use uh, this call in Kosovo. Now uh, we are in the bidding, uh, the tendering uh, phase for 600 megawatt to uh, by 300 uh, power plants. I want to raise also a small issue and I then would not like to uh, bother too much on this. There is um, the requirements for um, uh, efficiency on the coal-fired power plants actually are bringing uh, the investment uh, sometimes from 30 to almost 50 percent higher uh, investment uh, if we consider carbon capture or if we consider uh, ultra-critical uh, power plants. And, um, I think I proposed this once, uh, and uh, this is maybe for uh, DG Energy, for Energy Community, and others who are contributing to bil uh, building the policies on the energy, particularly on the energy uh, uh, which source is a conventional one, like coal, uh, to think about the, this difference to maybe consider as a contribution uh, uh, to uh, low emission, uh, but at the same time, maybe to uh, consider as uh, we are considering uh, energy from renewables. I'm talking just for these differences and talking from, for, from the point of view of the systems like Kosovo is, which is 97% based on coal-fired power plant with, uh, and uh, which country uh, is very poor on, on renewables like water, a country which uh, is uh, under average with, uh, with uh, wind and uh, also under average with, with a number of uh, sunny days in the country, which makes the um, investment on these, uh, 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 let's say, sources or, uh, much uh, 
uh, not very, very, very feasible, let's say. This is why in the, we, we are just uh, drafting the energy strategy and uh, this is why uh, we are concentrated much more and giving much more uh, priority to the energy efficiency uh, measures with uh, closing the whole cycle, even with intervention on fiscal policy through uh, commercial banks on the soft loans for uh, those who will implement the energy efficient materials and others. And I think that uh, on that sense, we will reach a pretty, pretty good results. But again, uh, remains the unflexible system based on coal will need uh, to be reconsidered how to be treated and how to uh, come and uh, run on this, uh, on this pretty uh, uh, difficult uh, race, let's say. The other things which we are um, in the process uh, in order to smooth on all, the, all this uh, uh, situation with uh, uh, environmental and with the compliance with EU directives is that we started uh, building an uh, uh, common electricity uh, um, market with Albania, which is a country of a similar uh, capacity, but which is more than 95% uh, uh, which sources are based in the water supply and water uh, hydropower plants, I mean. Uh, this, this will, uh, through optimization and through savings and through a real valorization of peak and unpeak uh, energy, uh, indirectly contribute to uh, environment and others and that is something also which has to be considered how to uh, valorize that contribution in comparison with our uh, uh, coal-fired uh, power plants. Um, it, it is envisaged that uh, this um, uh, uh, project with Albania will take uh, around two years which is now uh, going uh, parallelly with uh, building of new uh, 400 uh, kV line with, with Albania, which will make a, a very good uh, ring uh, with Greece, uh, Firom and, and, and Kosovo, as well with, uh, with uh, Montenegro and uh, contribute to the uh, submarine cable, which is planned uh, Montenegro, Montenegro, Italy. Just the last sentence is, uh, the investment in generation in Kosovo, uh, if we study carefully, actually will not in, uh, contribute just to the security of supply in, uh, in Kosovo, but will contribute heavily on the security of supply of the region and Southeast Europe. Uh, and I think it will contribute also on the project of common interest because Kosovo is even with uh, actual, uh, in actual situation, a very, uh, being so small, but very important electricity node in Southeast Europe. This uh, our neighbors knows, uh, also Anthony knows. By uh, building uh, new capacities, we are uh, just factorizing this node and we will need less investment on project of common interest on the transmission issue. Thank you very much and uh, I hope that it was not boring for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now before we go to a Q&A, we actually have two extra speakers that are not in your program. One is from the EU's newest member state, Croatia, and the other is from the next holder of the rotating EU presidency, Greece. Uh, so if I could welcome to the stage Alan Lever uh, Lever Leverich, who is Deputy Minister of Economy for Croatia. Thank you, dear chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I want to just present in this high-level conference the status of Croatia in the single, in the EU market, energy market. The process for development of the energy market in Croatia began currently with development of the European internal market, energy market by the end of the 90s. In addition to legislative measure, the real market development began with the process of Croatia accession to the European Union through improvement of the supply safety, competitiveness, and implementation of the energy and environmental policy. With regard to the exploitation of the mineral raw materials, 
In the act of the exploration and exploitation of hydrocarbons and the mining act are the laws that have been harmonized with the acquis communautaire and that enable further exploitation of oil and gas in the Republic of Croatia. Just to put the uh, information before 2013, it was unsecure to have exploitation, exploration of the hydrocarbons in Croatia. The law was so good that and who, get, who found the oil is, was not sure that he can use it. So we changed the law and this the first issue that we want the security of the investment. And now we are preparing the tender of the exploration and extraction of the hydrocarbons on Adriatic onshore, uh, offshore on Adriatic Sea. And just for your information, the first seismic said that there is a potential. So we will see what will happen after we change the law. The umbrella act of the creation energy sector is the Energy Act and the other energy market acts, electricity market act, the gas market, oil and petroleum, products market act, the thermal energy market act. We can say that we put on all the third energy package on the creation legislative and what, was, what is significant, we finished this before entering in the European Union. So that was one of the priority of the Croatian government to put the energy package before entering in the European Union. And now we are dealing with Croatian utility company to implement this third energy package. The energy market in the Republic of Croatia is open and the energy companies are preparing to participate at the single European energy market. Today we discussed about the price of energy in the Europe. Just to inform you, after entering in the European Union, the price of Croatia energy price Put down, it was, uh, it's going down for more than 10%. So liberalization of the market opening put the households has the 10% less price of energy before entering the European Union. And what was very interesting that all the companies who are selling the energy, one is Croatian and the other are foreigners, has two year contract with the households. So mean for two years they have security of that price. And second thing, what is very good, they're fighting, they're fighting every day. So that's mean that uh, when you see the commercials on the TV, it said every day there is some percentage going down the price of the electricity, so that's good. So we open market, we are satisfied of this, uh, that what's happening. With the addition, uh, the, the adoption of the Thermal Energy Market Act, uh, for organization of heating and cooling market in the Republic of Croatia has been created, including the coordination of specific activity with the market principles. This especially refers to production activities, preparation of the individual heat energy production and the particular market and termination of production prices, regulation and the market opening. Today we discussed about renewable energy. Croatia last week put on the government new action plan and the new concept of renewable energy. We stop all the project in the wind, we stop all the project in the solar and we push the biomass, biogas, and geothermal energy. Why? Because we have plant of them. So we put the feed-in tariffs on the high level of this market, and now we are 15.67% of the renewable, so we will do our target to 2020. But we don't want to do, give more stress to the people who live in Croatia to put up their price of the energy about for the renewable. We are now calculate, we calculate and put the new pie of the consumption of the, of the production of the renewable energy in Croatia. Also, another important area of adjustment in certainly the area of energy infrastructure and the important support of the economy. Now I would like to just mention a few notable Croatian projects in order to further develop the energy market in Southeastern Europe. The Adriatic Spot Market Project the company Jadranski Naftovod has launched a project of established spot market for trade with oil and petroleum products at the Adriatic Sea. It's an island of Kirk. The project includes a better use of existing infrastructure as well as the establishment of the new storage capacity for oil and the petroleum products, including modernization of the oil pipeline. This project will enable for the land locked countries, Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, functional use of the infrastructure and additional oil road and reduce dependence of the Russian supplier. Also, the list of the project of common interest contains Croatia project in the field of gas and electrical, electric power. The public of Croatia, together with the other member states, actively participate in the work of two regional groups, North-South Energy Interconnections in the Central Eastern Europe 
and the southeastern Europe to identify projects of quantum interest. Regulation of the European Parliament and the Council on guidelines for the trans-European energy infrastructure aims to develop gradually and incorrect trans-European uh, energy network. On, our, on the pro proposed list of the projects of quantum interest is the field of gas. There are six pr uh, creation projects in the field of electricity, two projects. I will not discuss about this project because it's open. You can read, but just one thing. One of the projects is LNG terminal of Island Network. That's meant the new transport of the gas to the Europe from the LNG. And uh, we did the Croatian government put it on the top priority of the Croatian government. So it will be finished in 2019 on the first half of the year. The second project is Ionian Adriatic pipeline. The third project is something new, I think that will be signed in a few days and we have the support of the commission is the project of Adriatic gas corridor. That's mean a supply of gas from Croatia to Hungary to Ukraine. That's new corridor. And what's very interesting, as the politician said, we agree on this project in only nine months. So on only nine months, we put all on the paper and I think in a few days, maybe, maybe tomorrow, if everything going okay, or in a few days, it will be signed by the Prime Minister of Hungary, the Prime Minister of Ukraine, and the Prime Minister of Croatia. So, the only goal of this project is diversification and security of the energy supply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And lastly, we will hear a very brief uh, preview of the next presidency from Konstantinos Matiodakis, who is Secretary General of the Energy and Climate Change Ministry of Greece. Thank you. First, allow me to convey the apologies of our minister for not being able <coughs> to participate to this uh, very important event for which we would like to extend our congratulations to the Lithuanian presidency. Thank you for allowing me this very short intervention just to signal priorities of the upcoming presidency of Greece. You know, Greece is taking the presidency first semester of 2014. Uh, priorities which are related to today's conference. The Greek presidency will address issues related to three landmark dates, namely the 2014 deadline set for completing the internal market, the 2015 deadline by which no member states should remain isolated from Europe's networks, and the 2015 International Climate Change Agreement. Our approach will be pragmatic. We will seek to promote the EU's agenda while taking into account the concerns of individual member states. Highlighting the contribution of the EU's goals towards the welfare of our citizens for affordable energy and the recovery of Europe's competitiveness will be a priority. The issues of climate and energy 2030 framework and energy prices will be debated on March Energy Council. Our initial intention slash ambition is to adopt Council conclusions regarding the Commission's analysis on the composition and drivers of energy prices and costs, if possible. We intend to focus on the impact on households, SMEs, and energy intensive industries in the context of EU's global competitiveness. As far as the internal market is concerned, we attach great importance to the debate scheduled for June on the Commission's project re progress report on the internal energy market. Areas to be reviewed include PCIs, vulnerable consumers, diversification of energy routes and energy sources, and the Commission action plan. The informal council in May should debate the progress as well as the work that remains to be done in order to meet the 2015 deadline by which non-member states should remain isolated from Europe's networks. The need to ensure that regions are also adequately integrated in the European grid will also be included to enable citizens throughout the EU to share the energy security and economic benefits provided by an integrated internal market. And with this, thank you for this short intervention. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll move on to the Q&A session. Can I get an idea of how many questions we have? Can you raise your hand if you would like to ask a question? Okay, that's my, so uh, maybe I'll just begin with one quick one first, because I'm very keen to ask it. Uh, and this morning in the World Energy Outlook report, we saw what a difference energy efficiency could make to reducing the EU's dependence on uh, foreign imports, but also reaching those EU goals. Uh, and yet, last year, we had a less than perfect agreement, I think, on the energy efficiency directive. We had an agreement that will not get us to the 20% by 2020 goal, the goal of increasing energy efficiency by 20%. Um, given that we have both of the presidencies of 2012 here, I couldn't resist asking uh, perhaps Minister Lidegaard and anyone else who would like to comment, um, what, you know, looking at that figure, looking at that chart, uh, which I appreciate you weren't here for in the morning, but the, showing the difference that energy efficiency can make, uh, and indeed uh, we heard that, we heard from Dr. Birol that efficiency is the greatest fuel potential that the EU has, how can, the member states make up that gap in between what the energy efficiency directive will deliver and what they have committed to for 2020. I basically think there are, there are two answers to that question. And, and the first one is that we need an ETS system that actually provides us with a price that makes it much more economic attractive to make these kind of investments and which are much more stable. And that's why we need a structural reform of the ETS system that, that, that put a price simply of, of, of not acting. And it's true that, that the energy efficiency directive will not take us the way. But even though we had a directive that would take us to 20%, it's still only a small percentage of the potential. So the other answer probably would be that we need definitely also to put a new target, if you ask me, for 2030. <laughs> and maybe this time we, we, we should put a target and then leave it to each single member state to decide how they will actually prove to that target. But it is definitely the best way to go about it if you want to do it cost efficient to have a new target in 2030 framework. Allow me one comment maybe. We should have a little political discussion as well, right? Price seems to be the factor many of the ministers are concerned about, including myself. Price is key in a situation where we have economic crisis in Europe. But I don't think the risk we are running here is that we are going to overinvest in infrastructure and energy efficiency. No, the real risk is that we are underinvesting these years. Our consumers are paying a higher price now. Our industries are paying a higher price today than they ought to do because we don't invest. That is the real risk. And that's why I think that we should put emphasis, of course we should never make an investment in infrastructure or energy efficiency, which we're not sure will benefit our consumers, of course. But that's not the case today. Today the case is that a lot of investments are not being made, even though they would benefit our consumers. And that is the problem I think we're facing. Um, our colleague from Croatia told that just to get connected to the European market, decreased their consumer prices with 10%. I think there are an enormous potential if we are making infrastructure and energy efficiency efforts as our economic people tell us to do. Maybe I could ask the ministers here, of, of those of you who are representing EU member states, uh, could any of you say right now that you wholeheartedly support it, either an infrastructure target for 2030 or a new efficiency target for 2030? I know we have very few times uh, to do other discussions, but uh, I think uh, actually I'm a person who do not believe too much about this uh, managing member states via the targets. Of course, some of them are really working and some of them are quite uh, good uh, to uh, push or enforce some processes run inside the country. But, but generally, you know, uh, the target uh, way management, uh, and I know we have a discussions about energy efficiency, you know, should be obligatory or should be not, you know, 
I do really not believe that, uh, that this will work on the end of the day. Talking about energy efficiency, once again, you know, there should be, you know, kind of market or economical motivators, not uh, motivators uh, really to uh, invest or improve the efficiency wherever they exist, you know. Industries, uh, housing, uh, transmission, uh, new technology, you know, uh, but, uh, but, but actually I do not believe too much that uh, this uh, forced uh, targets is a solution for overall European energy efficiency performance. Anybody else have more than targets? I do have a few comments. Now, on energy efficiency in general, I quite agree that this is often overlooked in discussions about gas market, electricity market, about all sorts of things, and energy efficiency does not uh, prominently feature enough. And I think that was also very, very explicit in the overall, this kind of cost prediction and the economic factor analysis that was provided by, by the chief economist of the energy agency. Now, I do disagree though with what, what Martin said that uh, I, I do believe that we have a significant risk of a potential over-investment over in infrastructure which might not necessarily be bankable the way we go about it in some cases. So it is really our responsibility to be able to find those regional cooperation mechanisms which enable us to avoid that. So uh, over-investment is a risk um, and uh, given that there is a limited amount of uh, connecting your facility money available for energy, electricity, as well as gas. It's five billion something. Essentially, uh, the consumers might end up paying for some of the, uh, or substantial part of, of this uh, infrastructure at the end of the day. And uh, that will add up to, to the story about the cost increases. Now, on the subject of objectives, Johan, uh, you've always been, uh, you know, an example to me of, of pragmatic politics, and I quite agree. I mean, this objective thing is sometimes be totally not objective. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll, it's a sad joke, but it's very true. Now, the uh, very different EU member states have different targets for renewables for 2020. Now, Latvia's target is 40 for zero. Okay, we are one of the greenest countries in the EU, top three with, with Sweden and Switzerland and Austria. Sorry, Switzerland out, so Austria and Sweden. So, uh, and something that happened uh, during these, you know, uh, document preparation is that there obviously some sort of methodology. If you, if you miss your interim target by 1% or more, you're marked red. So Latvia was marked red because we had I guess 33, but not 34 percent of the interim target. Whereas in some Norway, other country, and so we're red then, and some other country which say has uh, had to have five and they have four, uh, they also red, but another country which has like missed this by 0 0.2 and they are at three, uh, they are not red. So I think it's sometimes very funny what can happen if you start looking at, at numbers mechanically and uh, basing too much of political decisions and uh, financing and uh, uh, let's say all, all sorts of other measures on, on me mechanical targets. So I think we have to be sensitive about what we are going to achieve. Now, in terms of which should be the most important objective, I think it is important, Martin, in my beliefs, that we agree which one is the most important. So rather than have a set of targets which might actually be contradicting to each other, we should agree what it is in general that we would like to achieve. Is it carbon? Is it efficiency? Which of these? Uh, I think that we should really be clear about that at the end of the day for 2030, for post 2020. And whatever it is that there is a connection that was missed the last time round, which is the continent's competitiveness. And Martin, would you like to respond? Just very quickly. I do agree that no matter how we end this discussion and how many targets we're going to have next time, our package should be more in compliance. Because today we have the problem that 20% renewables, 
and 20% energy efficiency count for more than 20% CO2 reductions. So, of course, we have a problem with the ETS market. Uh, so, we have to learn from that experience. I mean, of course, there should be compliance between the, the CO2 targets and the other ones. The reason why I think that we should have actually not only three, but maybe four targets, also an infrastructure target, is because well, at least the Nordic experience is where we have created a single market. That it's very difficult to actually plan your infrastructure if you don't know how many renewables you will have. It might be that burden sharing in the old package was unfair, Daniels, but that's another discussion. But if you want to have a well-functioned single energy market, I don't think you can do that without proper interconnections and without knowing how much renewable you're going to face in. You can't plan your market if you don't know that, simply. But of course, I agree with you that we should have I mean, there should be much more logic between the different targets than we had last time, because you're completely right. It's not logical the way we constructed last time. Uh, but, but to have just one, I think that would make it very difficult for us to not over or under invest. Of course, you can over invest, but my point to us is that today, where you have the most will function and lowest prices, and that's the whole point, is in the Nordic countries where the percentage of transformation capacity is the highest. I believe in a liberal market. I believe in competition, but if you're not interconnected, you can't compete. Of course. So the target discussion is certainly something that's on everyone's brain right now. We will have the, well, the Commission's plan for at least one of those targets come out by the end of the year. Just a very small comment, because uh, Martin is, uh, is just intriguing us. But I just want to remember what Commissioner Oettinger said and uh, what our expert from OECD shows, uh, the competitive issue of this uh, uh, Europe vis-a-vis -vis, uh, United States and, and other you know, Talking about these 2030 uh, targets and, and well-balanced and, you know, planning the markets and giving some kind of preference to different, uh, certain type of sources of, uh, of energy. I think it is a quite uh, uh, contradictory. In one way, we are you know, trying to send messages to our audience, all these efficiency, renewables, all that thing. On the other side, we are looking for an uh, exit from this economic crisis. Uh, maybe we can move on from the target discussion real quick, because I want to make sure we get the audience in. Uh, can I have those people who raised their hands before? Are you still, are you still here? Anyone have a question? Uh, no? Okay, then let's keep talking about targets then. Uh, would any of the, I'm uh, sorry you guys are so far away from me down there, but would any of you like to weigh in? Uh, thank you. Uh, ju just a short comment. Concerning our target for, for, for 2030, of course we need a political debate, but we need also to know this time what will be the real, what will be the impact concerning our industry, concerning our economy, concerning the creation of jobs. Not to give up, but that's, we have to do something without make a real, a real de a decision. It, 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 this decision should be taken uh, from one country to the other. We, we, we have to um, need, uh, so uh, we have to find a different uh, targets because in my country now, in, 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 in Bulgaria, our target for 2020 for renewables is 16%. And this target is already reached. And unfortunately, it becomes a very, very expensive for our industry. And it's a very, very difficult for our uh, competitiveness. And it's difficult also to, to create jobs. So really needed a special political debate about our future. Thank you. Can I ask though, for, I mean, for anyone who is opposed to the idea of an efficiency target for 2030, how else do we fill in those gaps from the, uh, from the presentation we saw this morning in terms of the potential for energy efficiency that just doesn't look like it's going to be reached. Thank you very much once again. Um, uh, concern, uh, concerning the energy efficiency, I think that that is something that uh, uh, would be different of what I was discussing over there 
before even for the countries uh, under development or undeveloped countries or uh, parts of the countries of the European uh, Union or the Europe, let's say, as a whole, because um, the investment on the energy uh, efficiency, which we in Kosovo are intending as well to prioritize from now, is that they are not uh, affecting directly the, the tariffs first at all, which means that we will not have a kind of feeling tariffs on that, on that sense. And, that, and uh, parallelly with this, we are contributing to the uh, quality of life of, of, of the, the people, let's say, uh, not just on the uh, building, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, as well through, as I mentioned uh, before, through cogeneration issues and others, so we somehow bring a more efficient uh, uh, from electricity to uh, uh, thermal, ter thermal uh, megawatts uh, in place. Um, uh, and um, uh, on that sense, uh, I don't see that uh, the targets for energy efficiency cannot be reached. It, it's for, uh, uh, the, in, in comparison with uh, renewables, for different countries who has no real uh, sources, we should review the policy. If I don't have enough wind, sun and, and, and water, how can I uh, reach the, the, the target? That means that I have even to close some of the sources of electricity uh, uh, generation in order to reach the targets. This is something that we have really uh, very seriously to approach. It will be a kind of break, as we saw on the, on the uh, presentation before, of, of development of industries and other issues. Um, or uh, uh, find a way of, 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 of uh, uh, smaller alliances inside the, inside the, the European uh, Union, let's say. But we have to think about it. It's not, uh, it's not just uh, a break. It's also not fair in some cases to uh, have the same measures. So some derogation, some different, different uh, approaches based on the, on, the, on the characteristics of the, of the system and of the country. Should exist something. Uh, I just will mention, uh, in Kosovo, what we did, which was depending on us, was that actually we make reforms on electricity on, uh, and energy in a scholarship way. I mean, we made the restructuring of uh, the industry from vertically integrated uh, uh, energy companies unbundled, unbundled them properly. Uh, uh, parallelly, we went through uh, with the regulatory, as I mentioned, uh, all the uh, regulatory and legal framework which uh, is in place now and we are following second and third package and everything else. Uh, we privatized the distribution and supply of electricity and uh, uh, it is um, less than one year, but for sure, uh, until now, the signals are that it will be the first very, very successful privatization. Exactly. But we I just want to get something which is not depending on us. Yep, thank you very much. Thank I you. Sorry for. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, Martin, did you want to put in a word in defense of targets? I, I think the discussion about competition yeah. is extremely important. If you listen to uh, Fred Perol from the IEA, and their assessment, where is the problem? Why, why are the European energy prices so much higher than the American and the Asian? The main reason is the expensive gas from Russia. That's the main reason. Our dependency of importing gas. We are the region in the world importing most energy at all, and we have very limited competition. So to me, the only long-term solution to that would be to invest our money, instead of buying energy from outside Europe, invest putting our money in other countries, would be to invest the same money in energy efficiency, making the most competitive industry and efficient industry in the world, and invest in local energy resources. That is the long-term solution. I think, and I have to be very frank about this, I understand Dragomir's problem. I think that we have a problem in many parts of Europe that we pay too much for the renewables. You pay, I don't know you, I better say, but in some countries in, in Europe, they pay 
four, five, six as much as we do in Denmark. And the only reason is that we are well interconnected. So we can sell our wind for a good price. Then you don't need to subsidize it. If you can't sell your wind, then you have to subsidize it a lot because you can't get rid. And I think it must be a part of a new package that we do something about that because it's not fair. And many of your countries have been kept, so to speak. So no matter what we think about the targets, I still think we need them to plan our energy future, but we also need to find out how we create a market where you can get out of that kind of trap <laughs> you have come into. I, I, I agree on that, but don't throw out the baby with the bathroom water, because there is a reason why the power prices in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Finland are among the cheapest in Europe, even though we have a very high share of renewables. That's because we have a good market. We can sell it. If you don't have it, it's very expensive. If you have a good market, it's not. Okay, a very interesting discussion that I'm sure we can continue over the gala dinner. I'm afraid we have to cut us off because we've got to start the press conference next door.